organizations need to get even more return off of their investment in sales and marketing. And that's really what sales enablement is, ensuring that organizations for the investments that they make are getting the biggest value. This is Reveal, the revenue intelligence podcast, here to help go-to-market leaders do one thing, stop guessing. If you're ready to unlock reality and reach your full potential, this podcast is for you. I'm Danny Wasserman. And I'm Karina Owens, coming to you from the Gong Studios. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We are back for another episode of Reveal, and you're in for a special treat. We brought the one and only CRO of Showpad, Doug Brigg, aka King of Sales Leadership, to the podcast. Danny, can you give our listeners a bit of a preview of what are some highlights that we should be looking out for? Doug could probably be affectionately referred to as the godfather of sales, Karina. Like this was an episode that I wish you were there because his way of not pulling any punches, he doesn't mince words, he shoots from the hip and calls it like he sees it. What's so fun about Doug's wealth of experience is that over the decades he's been at his altitude, he has seen the things that have remained consistent and omnipresent. What does it take? And no surprise, certain things that we still put such an emphasis on in selling this year in 2023, they've still been relevant for the last few decades. Like you still have to deliver ROI. And I just appreciate when we talk so much about change and tectonic shifts and all of those statements can be true. Doug does a really nice job of boiling it back down to the basics. So I think our listeners are going to get a healthy dose of Doug's truth serum. Oh, that's a nice segue. Well, I love anything that talks about foundations. It's so lacking in so many organizations. So I can't wait to hear it. Let's dive right in. Doug, welcome to Reveal. Thank you very much. Thrilled to be here. Oh, man. Well, folks, regrettably, you're not joined by my co-host, Karina Owens, who is out on vacation. So you're stuck with these two old guys, old guys meaning, you know, the term of endearment that describes folks who are probably, you know, in their 40s. But nonetheless, yes, you're stuck with Danny and Doug today. Doug, knowing that you have seen over the 15 years at an executive altitude, sales leadership evolve. The first question I've got for you, also with your vantage point, having worked at Oracle and then now working for Showpad, which is about, what, 500 employees or so. I'm wondering, have there been things that have been put to bed from a sales leadership approach or philosophy that back in your heyday at Oracle with Larry was like, oh, this is widely accepted as the go-to playbook. And now in hindsight, with it being 2020, you'd say, what are we doing? Yeah, I think there are a few things that have changed. I mean, certainly back in the day, if I call back in the day being early internet days as the world was moving from client server to internet technology and stuff like that, you could really lean pretty hard on your technology advantage and just kind of anchor in feature and functions and stuff like, hey, I do a bunch of things, but I do them in a browser and I do them in an internet architecture. Or if you were in situations where you were truly on the leading edge of new markets, new categories of enterprise software that were being created, you could bias to the technology. I think right now it's much more about anchoring in the sociology more than the technology that's out there because there's a litany of choices and virtually everything out there in the market. It's really about business value. It's really about shifting from talking about your features and your functions to the impact you can have on the business that you're speaking with. And as you think about the sociology prioritization, we've talked a lot about just the compressed shelf life of innovation in today's age, right? So many of us, regardless of where we're coming from, feel the pressures of commoditization driving down price. And I'm wondering, thinking back to you know, 10, 15 years ago, were you more immune to that? Because although, yes, competition was present, the pace at which competitors could replicate or imitate your breathtaking, cutting-edge innovation that separated you more concretely, that had a shelf life of 6 to 12 to 18 months, whereas now people are rolling out new features, if it's not weekly, monthly, or quarterly, that then continues to exacerbate what we're all feeling in commoditized competition. I think across the board, right? I mean, okay. what's different now is there are multiple software companies in every category and new ones being created this morning that we haven't heard of, but will be a part of our common vernacular in 12 to 18 months. It's the pace of innovation. I think part of that is tracking to the pace of investment, right? Hmm. There's just more money being put into what is out there from a business or 
governmental impact that can become software, whether that's hardware services, like everybody wants to softwareify the world, I think. And so there's a relentless amount of investment being made to get there. At the same time, you can develop this stuff a heck of a lot faster than you used to. You used to need hundreds and hundreds of people and long, long development processes. You can build things cheaper, faster, better for more impact, throw them up on the web, not have to have an entire distribution force to get going. So a lot has shifted and changed. And thinking about what has changed, obviously, you just have such a unique perspective to see, holy cow, what were we thinking back then? Or maybe it was relevant then, but the tectonic shifts that we've experienced have now made them null and void. What has been everlasting that in the 15 years of being an executive level altitude, what still remains consistent and omnipresent? I think for me, if you look at my career, it's been all about B2P enterprise software, right? That's where I've been. And at the beginning, at the middle, and at the end, if this is at the end, wherever I am in my journey, it's always been about solving business problems, mm -hmm. right? And sometimes people get caught up in the features, the functions, or the technology. But as I talked about, basically, people are looking for how can software solutions, how can market solutions that are out there help me solve, eliminate, make something go better in my business. It's the unrelenting focus on what does this mean, not what does my widget do that has always endured. Endured on two fronts. One, getting a deal done, but two, getting the biggest deal done. Because the bigger the impact, the more you can anchor in that in your good old-fashioned negotiation. And thinking about you know what remains true and consistent, solving business problems, a lot of what we think about, you come from a world of enablement, but very closely partner with our value engineering or value consulting team, is how do we extrapolate when we are solving business problems that measurable, defensible, concrete amount of whether it's in dollars and cents or time savings. When you think back to what you were able to extrapolate 15 years ago versus what is much more surgically precise, thanks to the advances in technology, does that help accelerate and simplify the process of, quote, solving business problems? Or in fact, are those tactics still the same? So it's probably the worst possible answer, yes. In other <laughs> words, there's a situational aspect to this where if you are bringing from your first engagements through your midpoint, through the conclusion, a value-centric mindset, if you're co-creating that with your mm -hmm. customer, that is rock solid, enduring, a way to go. This is not a like, oh, I've entered stage six and now I should ask, is there value in you buying this solution <laughs> or what is the value? Yeah. At the same time, there's a tsunami of vendor provided evidence that tries to kind of peanut butter. Oh, look at the value. Here's the value. Here's the value. And I think like most of us, that's nice. That's interesting. Maybe I want to learn more, but does that really apply to me, right? Yeah. And so I just feel like what's still most enduring is co-creating mm. the value. In the absence of being able to co-create it, the discussion that is, we may just not be the right vendor for you for this problem, but the ability to co-create to me has always been enduring. And the expectation has also been enduring both as far as if the sort of playbook is co-create throughout as opposed to in stage six, has the expectation in your 15 years as an exec, has that become elevated as competition and commoditization have intensified? Yes, absolutely. And I think part of what has elevated that is, look, like all of us in our personal portfolios and our personal lives, we want bang for our buck, right? So wherever we're going to invest our dollars, save our dollars, spend our dollars on vacation or holiday, whatever it is, we want the maximum return. And that's what businesses want. So, you know, we kind of have this conversation internally a lot. Is this a yawner? Meaning like, is the value prop here like, hey, yeah, we're going to give you a dollar and we're going to get back a dollar. Okay. Like, that's nice, but that's not getting me out of bed an hour early to go, you know, run yeah. up some hill and say, let's go do this. So I think there's an expectation of more impact. I think the other part of it is because software today can be deployed at a much greater rate than it could 15 years ago, the patience to wait to start to see the payoff is radically different. Like, I mean, I'm old enough that there was a time that it was quarters and years before you knew, like, was this thing going to pay back? Now, sometimes you have days, weeks, and months before you get the payback. 
I think the last part of that is software is much more disposable now, right? In the world of SaaS, people are able to get on to things fairly quickly, see value very quickly. Hey, if those things didn't line up as we thought, then we're looking to dispose of this and find a different asset in one, two, or three years, as opposed to perhaps the previous timelines. The word you use that I'm really latching on to is patience. And as someone who does not possess that virtue at all, I just asked my friends, I think about as a consumer, I'm so accustomed to being delighted by same day delivery now, which, you know, even in my lifetime, five, 10 years ago, forget about it. That was just out of the question. Even if you wanted to pay a premium, the only thing you were getting same day was your pizza. And even that was 30 minutes. And because that has then transcended into other facets in my life where I want to be instantaneously delighted if I think about Netflix or Spotify and my willingness to tolerate a recommendation that doesn't instantly give me that dopamine or serotonin fix, I swipe next. Thinking about dating, right? Like the abundance of just being able to swipe. So what that then does is it trickles back into B2B sales. Do you guys feel from your customers heightened pressure to instantaneously, I think was the word you used, instantaneously trigger that value realization? And does that subsequently then influence either how you go to market with products or how you also then train your sellers as you think about the playbooks they're using, the messages that they're using in both pre and post sales? Yeah. So I think the answer is a little bit of, it depends on what you've got out there, what you're taking to the market. I think the most important thing is to manage expectations, right? If you have something that can stimulate the serotonin and the dopamine, like same day delivery or some of the advancements that have come out, then obviously tickle that as much as you can because you're going to be able to go release that. If the reality is, hey, look, we're going to need a little time, right? How can I show you I'm impacting your rep ramp time if by our own agreement, it takes you seven months to ramp a new seller, right? I need a few cycles to be able to show you I'm shortening that. So, It's really like everything in sales. It's about managing expectations, communicating, and connecting back to if you can't wait to determine the return, then we're either deciding there's a leap of faith that you're going to make, like you're in and you just believe it's there and we'll find out on the back end if it's there. Or again, maybe this is just not the right solution for the problem you're trying to solve urgently today. And sourcing the talent to field your team that's willing to either deliver that dopamine serotonin fix if you're in a position to do that or ask someone trust me take this leap of faith because we're going to need the cycles either way i'm wondering as you examine the fingerprints or the makeups of successful sales personas 15 years ago versus those who are wildly successful today talk about that transition or evolution or is it still one in the same Honestly, for me, it's still one in the same what's just different is you know a couple decades have gone by And when I think about performers, I'm not talking about Dexie's Midnight Runners, one hit wonder out there for any 80s fans that are listening to this, but (laughs) not the one rep that had one great year and then two years of what happened. But the reps, the performers that consistently hit their month, their quarter, their year over and over, the things that I see in top talent today are no different than the things I saw decades ago in top talent. First of all, it is about grit right? And grind. Like it is a daily grind for top performers, for the people that consistently crush their competitors and their colleagues in terms of their own leaderboard. You literally outwork your competitor and you outwork your colleagues. Consistency is about bringing a learner's mindset, right? You have to learn and be wanting to learn about what is the value that you're solution brings to the market? What are the problems that we solve? You need to enter these customer conversations with a learner's mindset of, look, I got one mouth, I got two ears, I need to kind of operate in that ratio. I need to learn about what's going on over here and what you're trying to do, because only then am I credible enough to start to get into, dare I say, prescribing potential solutions for that. That also allows us to anchor into that value. And if you do those things well, and you have a strong value that you can is highly defendable, even for the most skilled procurement negotiator in the world, that lets you get a very fair price point. And those are the people that tend to not discount their way to the bottom of the leaderboard, but hold value to the way to the summit of the leaderboard. Dig it. So 
in referencing the grind that is sales today, not that it wasn't a grind before, but in particular today, it is a daily grind. Showpad, your company, is an enablement platform. So I'd love for you to talk about enablement in two capacities. First, Doug, is, you know, what is the value of enablement for your customers today? Why do they choose Showpad? So talk a little bit about that. And then internally, I have to think that you guys as an enablement company have your own enablement team. So would then secondarily love to hear how do you best partner as the CRO with enablement to extract value from that function so your people show up out in the field best prepared? It's a great question. I mean, look, sales enablement is very hot, very sexy right now. Ask any analyst out there, investments are, you know, well over 50% year over year increase as more and more organizations are pouring more and more money into sales enablement. And the fun thing about Showpad is we're kind of sitting right there in the nexus of that as those yeah. investments happen. Quite simply, organizations, if you could sell whatever you're selling on Amazon, you would. In the event you can't do that or you can't sell on a website and you need a Salesforce or a customer success team or a partner network, whatever it is, your ability to get the maximum return for that investment is paramount. More than ever, organizations now need to get even more return off of their investment in sales and marketing. And that's really what sales enablement is ensuring that organizations for the investments that they make in their people and their marketing and their content in their process are getting the biggest value. Two primary levers that we see is increasing overall productivity in your sales organization and in your marketing efficiency, and then your ability to reduce the time it takes for new people, new sales, new customer success, whatever we're talking about, call that ramping time for new people, be able to reduce that. Meaning if it used to take you six months to get Doug fully productive, how do we get that to five? How do we get that to four and a half? Can we get it to four? Because when you start to scale the math of that, the investments that you're making are driving a greater return for the business and everybody's looking to grow, right? Regardless of what we hear in the news, Overall, GDPs are still increasing. Companies are still looking to grow. We just need to grow more efficiently. And that's the space that we're living in and why it's an exciting time for us. Doug couldn't be more correct about the importance of a growth mindset in all sales reps and leaders. Why? Because a leader with a growth mindset can impact their team through their communication, integrity, inspiration, humility, empathy, and listening skills. That was a lot. And actually, according to High Spot, great sales leaders impact their teams and their bottom line in a big way. An effective sales leader's average annual quota attainment sits around 105%. And when leaders offer training opportunities like mindset courses to their reps, they see a boost in win rates by 28%. This is all because of the impact and investment they have on their team. That's intentionality if I've ever heard it. So what's the call to action here? Invest in yourself and in your team. Let's get back to Doug. To your second part of your question, which is internally, these are the exact conversations that we have, right? Yeah. We plot our reps along A, Bs, and Cs, right? Who are the A's? What are they doing? How do we learn from them? We don't spend a lot of time trying to think, how do I make an A rep an A plus rep? We spend most of our time focused on the Bs and Cs. If you think of it as a bell curve, with most of your B reps are probably in the middle of that bell curve. What can we do to make our B reps B plus reps, A minus reps? We can do that at scale. That is the equivalent of putting dozens or in some cases, hundreds of more sales people into the business and learning from how are we doing that and where are we doing that? And that's this whole evolution for sales enablement from what was, I think, in the eyes of some historically a nice to have, it is now very much front and center as a must to have in virtually every organization that we talk to. I'll tell listeners a little bit about my journey into joining sales enablement because it was, you know, first blush, one of reluctance. And, you know, I was an A player in sales, was making money hand over fist in that, taking on a lot of the stress that comes with, you know, a 50-50 split between fixed and variable. But I looked at enablement, Doug, with kind of an air of condescension, like, oh, those who can't do teach, and what do you really know? You don't viscerally understand the grind, the daily suck that is our job. So 
here we are in the locker room for lack of a better analogy and you guys are consultants that at best can tangentially explain or understand what it is that we experience and i'm wondering does that stigma of enablement does that carry through in your organization or does that carry through in the customers that you try and sell to given that those are your primary prospects and if that does exist, how do you overcome that stigma? Or perhaps you can shed light on the fact that, no, actually, we now live in an era of, you know, sexy rebirth and enablement, and we've overcome that reputation and stigma. And in fact, now we are very much celebrating a legitimization of the profession. Yeah. Look, I think that what we see is the elevation of sales enablement, as I believe Justin Timberlake once says, bringing sexy back. It's just making it even sexier is rampant in the business world out there. And I think historically, some organizations looked at sales enablement like, let's go look for educators or teachers, as opposed to actually the best teachers or enablers, the word is in itself the answer, are the people that have been on this journey and have that firsthand experience on what it takes to be successful. So we kind of see in the market, we see a spectrum of that. Like we'll go into accounts where it's like, okay, they've taken a kind of educational outside in approach. We're going to teach our way to better enablement, which is a little bit more of a push motion than could you organize your team with individuals and people that have the ability to teach and coach, but also have some pull from credibility of, Hey, like I, you carried a bag, right? You understand what it's like out there. You know what it means to get on a forecast call and be in front of a customer and all the dynamics that happen. And so it's situational, but more and more, you know, I think there was a time that if you had a CRO that was out there, sales enablement wasn't at their table. Every CRO that I know right now, sales enablement's at the table, right? With the head of this sales team and the head of that sales team and your other key lieutenants. Sales enablement's at the table. If they're not at the table, I would encourage you to look in the mirror and ask, why not? Are you missing an opportunity for a significant impact to your business? Well, as an ambassador for the enablement professionals who tune in every week to reveal, thank you for continuing to advocate for our seat at the table and having a vote. It certainly means a ton to us because I think we are overcoming what has been historically a trend where we don't necessarily have, I think, that kind of voting power. I want to shift gears a little bit, Doug, because it is not often that we have someone who wields such influence like you with an organization on the lines. And thinking about the number of times you are pitched from BDRs, SDRs, you are prospected into because of what you can ultimately decide within Showpad. I'm curious, what moves the needle for you when you're being sold to, especially in an economy like this where everyone's scrutinizing their spend? In fact, A lot of things are hitting the editing room floor because they aren't, to your point, delivering that dopamine serotonin value that we all expect. Yeah. Like all of us, I probably get a hundred pitches a week, you know, from some of the most divine SDRs out there and some horrific SDR pitches that are out there. And honestly, I delete virtually all of them. Like I say that with love in my heart for the role of being an SDR and a BDR, but like, I don't have the time to read your pitch or read your email. Every so often, somebody will land a compelling message. And I say this to my own BDR team. I can't really teach it to you because it's situational. Like there's a heightened moment in my business or in my head. And at that moment, somebody hits me on that exact topic. And you're like, oh, what are they talking about here? But that is like serendipity. That's not scalable, repeatable. That's just serendipity. The number one way that good SDRs and good sellers get in front of me is they drive impact with my team, right? They're working with my team to understand what are the problems that you're trying to solve, right? And learning about us, learning about the impact that we're trying to have in the business and kind of being brought to me as opposed to, I'm going to start with Doug and think he's going to drive down into the business and say, full stop, let's go unplug this piece of software and go put this new one in because I got a great sales pitch. So to me, the same things that worked for me as a seller to get to myself or to get to the CRO or whoever the C-level executive was hold true. Be credible with my team, earn the right, ask for to be sponsored and brought to me. And then when you show up, you darn well better dazzle me. 
absolutely dazzle me because you should be ready to just knock my socks off with your impact. And in the dazzling, I'm curious because no one is anonymous anymore. It's so easy to find all sorts of information. Hopefully not too many skeletons in the closet, but enough context to show up for that first touch point with you, Doug. And is there a tipping point where personalization, you talked about, you know, now more than ever, the sociology or the psychology of selling that personalization. Can there be an over rotation where you're actually a little turned off and creeped out by how the hell did you know that? Or if people are going to the lengths, we have some SDRs who are thinking, oh my God, Doug, you know, I know your alma mater is this. So I went to the trouble of sending you a personalized token of your alma mater to your house. I've heard some executives be like, who the hell are you? This is creepy. Get off my doorstep. And other be like, hey, like, bravo. Thanks for going that extra length. I'm willing to give you a few minutes. What do you think about that? Yeah, I kind of live in both worlds. I'm like, this is super creepy, but Bob, bravo. I mean, I've responded to some people to be like, this was really well done. Awesome. I have no interest in talking to you. I just want to let you know it did resonate. Like it does connect with me or go talk to this person over here. I think we talked earlier about grit and grind. Like when I get some of those creep show moments are like the, wow, this person studied me like a private investigator. Like, bravo, because they're clearly putting in a ton of effort. I mean, you know, since we took Marketo public, it's all been private companies. You don't have a 10K to read about me or my business. You got to go figure out what's going on and how you get there. But I generally applaud creativity in trying to find a meaningful connection point. Only a couple of times have I been really, really creeped out. Yeah. To synthesize a little bit about your philosophy, because I know we've got a lot of SDRs and early in career sellers who tune in every week, what you've described as sort of the odds of a serendipitous top-down discover and descend land with you, it's really only when it's a full moon and you know Mercury's in retrograde and the stars align that we just pierce your soul conveniently at the right time. But otherwise, at least for your sake, it's got to be a groundswell that cultivates enough momentum where it bubbles up to earn your willingness to entertain a sponsorship. I'm just wondering, especially in today's era, I think about even pushing initiatives internally to get things over the finish line from an enablement perspective. If we don't have the CRO in this economy, things could go sideways for a variety of reasons. We've got internal detractors. We've got shifts in priorities. We've just got budget cuts that I can't control. So I'm wondering, you know, for folks that are trying to sell to you or to your peers at that apex, although you want people to start generally from the bottom up, if they don't have your support, the level of confidence in putting that deal into someone's forecast, if they don't have Doug's buy-in, I think would give anyone on the other end of the table who's trying to sell to you some reservations to put this in commit. So, I mean, although we have to generally, it sounds like, start from the bottom and work our way up to you, is it your belief still that without your endorsement, things may not get done? I think to a certain point, Yes. I mean, we're talking about what should be forecasted, but what should be in pipeline, right? I'd like to believe that if you're working with my team on a project, like we don't exactly have a lot of free time that we're like, hey, I'm bored. Let's go look at software, right? Let's go evaluate somebody's (laughs) software and terrorize some SDR pre-sales and sales rep pretending that we have a deal with some deep (laughs) insidious lab. You know, I think the question is if we're pulling the rope, right? Meaning our organization is pulling the rope and we're asking you to help us envision your software in our business to solve our problems. I think we're declaring it belongs in your pipeline. We're not going to waste your time because we're not going to waste our time. Now, the question becomes, when can you be confident? I think in this market, more than ever, it's you have to exhaust all the reasons why a deal will not happen before you can be reasonably confident the deal might happen. Like when you're out of all the reasons it can't happen, you maybe have a pretty good chance that it might happen. And part of that could be, as you just said, access to the CRO. So if you're following what I'm asking you to follow, right, which is you're working with our team and now you've reached the point where it's like, but okay, I've said all along, I'm going to do these three things for you and then you're going to take me to Doug. If the team is saying no, big red or yellow light, right? On forecastability. Now, we're not going to tell you, oh, by the way, we're having a tough quarter in the background or something's going on, but let these indicator lights help you guide your forecast. Don't say, I need to get to Doug because I need to get to Doug, right? Make it a part of your negotiation in your sales process. But honestly, Doug's only part of it. CFO, more than ever, is the most important vote in all of these software decisions. 
every organization is asking the question, how can we do more with less software or consolidate the number of tools, the number of vendors that are out there? That is a business decision, also a financial decision. When you talk about you need to exhaust every reason why the deal shouldn't get done, inherently in that mindset is a healthy dose of skepticism. And I'm wondering when there is that skepticism in sales, is there a point where skepticism can over rotate and it actually becomes counterproductive because I don't know, it makes people sandbag because they're just too scared to put anything in there? I'd say that's question one. When can you over rotate? So, how do you throttle your skepticism? Yeah. And then two, in using that level of scrutiny, can you apply that same level of scrutiny to other facets of your life outside of work? Absolutely. Absolutely. This pendulum can over rotate into not only do I have no pipeline, I have no forecast, but it's because I'm employing your deliberate, you know, skeptic first kind of approach to things. I do think that that pendulum for newer sellers, so folks that grew up in enterprise software in maybe the last, you know, six or eight years. With the exception of some really, you know, some craziness around when COVID, you know, bloomed into the world, they haven't really known a headwind environment like this. And so yeah. there was an overly optimistic mindset like, well, so-and-so told me the deal is going to get done. And so it's just trying to not over rotate to skepticism, but to get it to somewhere in the middle. At the end of the day, we get paid as sellers to make things happen. We get paid as sellers to predict the future. Part of the importance of anchoring and value is the ability to talk about, by the way, every month that you don't do something, it's going to cost you this or you're not going to be able to go get that. That is a stimulating means to move things along. But it is an element of situational adaptation to what's happening in the market, in the business. Not rose-colored glasses, not glasses shattered and nothing's going to happen but finding your midpoint. I'm a big believer in kind of just what happens if they don't buy software? Let's just have that conversation. Have we asked them that question, right? Not like, well, I think it's this and that. If the answers are there's real impact there, we feel a lot better about, and now we're into the subjectivity of human behavior and like, come on, we need to go make this happen. To your point about the personal life, look, I say this all the time. Anybody that knows me is going to kind of roll their eyes at this. I try to live my life glass half full, right? I am very much a Ted Lasso kind of person outside of the office is the best I can be. Right now, I get paid to be the CRO of this business a little bit glass half empty, right? Because there's a lot of adverse conditions that are out there. There's headwinds in the markets. And so my focus on, hey, let's focus on what are the challenges? What are the things that are going to prevent us from hitting our number or getting us to this deal or overall productivity? comes not because I want to be negative Nelly. It just becomes I want to make sure we're paying attention to everything. And so, yes, it does have moments where we rotate back and forth between the personal and the professional side of this. But ultimately, look, sales is about optimism, right? Sales is about we have an ability to have a positive impact on your business, on your career progression, right? That's what we want to have. That's the conversation. And if we have that, let's go celebrate that. Let's go amplify that. And let's go get those sorts of projects done. Well, thinking about in the years of sales leadership that you've experienced, Doug, I'm wondering as we wrap, is there one lesson either from a victory or even a failure, one lesson that continues to serve as maybe not the singular North Star, but what is a governing precept from an experience you firsthand endured, good or bad, that shapes how you show up every day at work? Honestly, I think it goes back to what I said about kind of grit and grind. It's crush your day, right? Whatever your day is, if your day is a hundred phone calls, if your day is, you know, a thousand emails, whatever your day is, as a seller, as an SDR, as whatever, if you did everything you could to crush your day, regardless of what happened, on the deals, on the pipeline, whatever the metrics are, hold your head high and know you crushed the day. You did the best you could. All anybody can ever ask of us is the best that you can give me today. Not tomorrow, not yesterday, today. Crush the day, own the day. You start to stack some days together, really, really great things happen. Good habits get established. Great careers get made and a lot of money can flow around. 
dig it. Well, for anyone who's listened to Reveal, you're aware that the next question is one that we ask every single guest. Doug, you are no exception. If you were to describe sales in just one word, what would it be? Sales in one word to me is contact. Say more. It's a contact sport, right? It's a contact sport. Sometimes it's about who you're contacting, who you're talking with. It's about relationships. Sometimes it's about, you know, to get overly sporty, right? Sometimes you just got to go hit, right? And it's a competitive world. You got to be prepared to go mix it up a little bit out there on the pitch, as they say. One of our operating principles here at Gong is no sugar. And I appreciate the candor in what you're signing up for, for a daily grind of contact in the world of sales. Well, Doug, this has been a tremendous amount of wisdom that you've shared over the last few minutes with our listeners. Cannot thank you enough. For folks listening, this is Doug Grigg, the Chief Revenue Officer of Showpad. Doug, thanks so much for coming to Reveal. Pleasure being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Reveal. If you want more resources on how revenue intelligence can help you create high-performing sales teams, head on over to gong.io. And if you like what you heard, give us that five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you may listen.